back in December, there was that hearing before a House committee. You had Claudine Gay, who was the president of Harvard University. She has since resigned. You had Liz McGill, who was the president of Penn, and Sally Kornbluth, who was the president of MIT, still for now, who testified about anti-Semitism on college campuses. That did not go well. There was a very testy exchange between Claudine Gay and Republican Congresswoman Elise Stefanik of New York that went hyper-viral, mostly because of Claudine Gay's inability to just give straight answers to what should have been combative, but more or less easy to answer yes or no questions. That push has been fueled not purely by the students. Let's just be clear. This is not an organic student-led effort. This has been led by conservative outside commentators, conservative activist journalists who have made no secret of their actions, including Christopher Rufo and others, and billionaire alumni. This is not a fight of the rank and file. You have billionaire alumni like Bill Ackman, who went to Harvard, Mark Rowan, who's a major donor at Penn, who are pushing these changes. Add to that accusations of plagiarism that befell Claudine Gay, which she addressed, which she the university has already taken steps to, uh, to deal with, none of which had to do with stealing ideas, but more had to do with citations, poor quotations, putting materials into her work that didn't have the proper attribution. So it wasn't really like she passed off the entirety of someone else's work as her own. It wasn't quite that dire. Bill Ackman's wife, Neri Oxman, also got pinched for plagiarism for some of her work when she was at MIT. That's all background. What's happened since? Oh my God, so much. First of all, let's talk about the University of Pennsylvania in one of my favorite cities, Philadelphia. Penn, according to a piece from the New York Times, has been dealing with the ongoing impact of the scandals following that House hearing and over the impact of anti-Semitism on campus. Last week, a number of professors at Penn staged a rally on campus targeting a private equity billionaire named Mark Rowan. He is an alumnus of Penn, a major donor of the university, of the kind that universities tend to ask for lots of sums of money from. He was one of the people who pushed very hard against the former president, Elizabeth McGill, and led to her resigning in December. Sidebar, before I keep going, I should note that these two, Liz McGill and Claudine Gay, only resigned as the president's of the university. They didn't step down from the university overall. They went back to being professors. Claudine Gay is a professor of African American studies and history, and I believe Liz McGill is a law professor, I think, but neither of them actually quit the institution. They just stepped down from the role of the presidency. It's also not entirely unusual for faculty to become the presidents of universities and then go back. I mean, it happens uh, Nicholas Dirks, who used to be the chancellor of UC Berkeley, went back to being a professor at UC Berkeley after he was the chancellor. Uh, and UC Berkeley, by the way, has a president of the 10 campus system. And then each campus, UC Berkeley, UCLA, UC San Francisco, has a chancellor. So that's why I said chancellor versus president. But that kind of a relationship is not unusual. So it's not weird for a professor to become the president and then go back to being the professor. Or for a university president somewhere else to become the president of a different university and then become a professor at that same school after their presidency is over. That's not at all unheard of. It's actually quite common. So, Mr. Rowan, he's the guy who also, if you remember on this show, we talked about this, they put together this document called Moving Forward, which was viewed as kind of a pullback from some of the ongoing, arguably more progressive educational values at the University of Pennsylvania, and reshifted away from some of those tenets. According to the Times, the protest was about 100 people at a time when folks were hoping that they could kind of move beyond some of the drama that had kicked up after the controversies over anti-Semitism on campus. The core of this argument, both Penn and Harvard and elsewhere, is that the progressive mentality of a lot of these elite schools has created an environment that not only suppresses more conservative voices, but is unnecessarily timid at fighting back against things like anti-Semitism, or even that allows it to proliferate, not even just for fear of, of pushing back against it. Whether or not that's true, I don't know, because I'm not on these campuses, but that is part of the underpinning of it. Penn, however, is also facing a lawsuit brought by some of its students. According to the Times, the university is a defendant in a lawsuit filed by Jewish students 
but partly financed by unnamed donors. So there's a lot of bigger money there. State Republican lawmakers in Pennsylvania have threatened to withhold $31 million for Penn's Veterinary Medicine Program. It's Penn's only state funding, but Penn's Veterinary Medicine Program is a big deal. It's one. Of, it's probably the preeminent in the country, if not one of them. And there was a fundraiser funded partly by two Penn alumni, Bill Rowan and Ronald Lauder of the Estee Lauder Fortune, for the re-election of a congresswoman named Virginia Fox, a Republican from North Carolina. Virginia Fox is on a House committee that's investigating universities over anti-Semitism. So this has run deep and has turned into a political effort that is bigger than just these schools. There's also, as the Times article notes, an investigation by the House Ways and Means Committee questioning whether if a university doesn't take sufficient action against anti-Semitism, you can take away their nonprofit status altogether. So this would target Penn, Harvard, MIT, also Cornell, as the Times write-up noted. So that is one piece of this. There's the big billionaire money that has been coming after big universities along this line. Another billionaire regarding Harvard, Ken Griffin, who has said, according to the Harvard Crimson, which is the student newspaper, an excellent student newspaper, that he is going to stop donating to Harvard over all of this, at least for the time being. He just gave, a year ago, a huge gift of $300 million to Harvard's Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Ken Griffin was speaking at a conference in Miami, didn't say that he'll never give money again, but said he's going to stop. While he was at the conference, he said, according to the Harvard Crimson, quote, I'd like that, meaning the state of affairs at Harvard, to change. And I've made that clear to members of the corporate board, but until Harvard makes it very clear that they're going to resume their role as educating young American men and women to be leaders, to be problem solvers, to take on difficult issues, I'm not interested in supporting the institution, unquote. He also referred to Harvard students as, quote, whiny snowflakes. Okay, now I'm confused. He said until they resume their role as educating young American women to take on difficult issues. So how does fighting... DEI do that. I'm not clear on that causal connection. I understand the argument that says we focus too much on ideological issues and not enough on core academics. Okay, fine. But I don't think that anyone who really looks at Harvard with a, a, a common sense eye thinks that Harvard graduates get ahead in life because they're so much better educated as opposed to them being so much better connected. Let's just be real. Tom Cotton, who's a senator from Arkansas, a Republican senator, in the hearing yesterday about social media, kept asking the CEO of TikTok where he's from, and he said, Singapore, and then asked him, have you ever been involved in the Chinese Communist Party? And the guy said, no, I'm from Singapore, and said, have you ever had any dealings with the Chinese? Have you ever applied to be a member of the Chinese Communist Party? And the CEO said, Senator, I'm from, no, I'm from Singapore. Well, what is your perspective on the Tiananmen Square massacre? Tom Cotton went to Harvard. So don't tell me that Harvard kids are just so much smarter than everybody else, because clearly Tom Cotton either didn't get it or didn't give a damn, but kept asking this guy, Sho Chu, who's the CEO of TikTok, about his potential Communist Party ties. I mean, he sounded very Joseph McCarthy in all of this. I mean, come on, Senator. Have you no decency at long last? So I understand where it's coming from. I just question whether or not it is actually a matter of education. And I think that there's a larger acknowledgement of just pure influence that happens at Harvard because this is an influence game. I've got billions of dollars. I'm a major donor. I'm an alumnus. I have something to say the school needs to change. Now, do alumni get to do that under normal circumstances? Yes, sure. If you're an alumnus, that's within your prerogative. Sure, you get to do that. But let's not pretend this is all about academics. The rest of us who didn't get to go to schools like Harvard know what the real game is. A university degree is also a credential that confers it. And if that's not the case, then why is it that all of these people with massive amounts of money and influence are trying to influence the way the university runs? Because that's the game that's played. They know how things get done. We'd be naive not to see it that way. But there have been other developments as well. Besides these fancy private institutions, public schools have also been making some rather significant changes as well. In my home state of Florida, not too long ago, just the, I guess last week, I believe it was, the state, of, the state university system removed sociology as a core course requirement. 
completely. The state will ban funding for DEI initiatives at state colleges and universities. This does not include, for example, the University of Miami, where I went to school, because that is a private university. That would include the University of Florida, Florida International, the University of South Florida, Central Florida, West Florida, North Florida, the historically black college, Florida a and University, Florida State University, those are all part of the state university system. So that means that sociology is no longer a general education core course option. DEI spending is banned altogether. It looked like all but two people supported that measure. And this is an ongoing effort of Florida's governor, Ron DeSantis, to crack down on DEI in very, very specific ways. It's part of a larger academic crackdown, which, for example, has changed the nature of certain uh, advanced placement courses in African-American history and psychology and sociology and others to step back from certain kinds of conversations about race and diversity and culture. I mentioned that Claudine Gay, the previous president of Harvard, resigned to return to being just faculty. The Harvard Crimson did speak to the current or the interim president of Harvard University. His name is Alan Garber. He is also a university alumnus, and he referred to what he called a pernicious climate of anti-Semitism on campus, said that he is going to work on tackling that on campus. He said in part to the Crimson, quote, what I have found the most disturbing of all are situations or experiences students describe where they have felt they could not speak in class because there are attacks on Israel or maybe they feel unsupported in contradicting them, unquote. So the issue that he is at least pointing to is that students just don't even feel safe speaking in class. And although he believes in free speech, he also wants to talk about what kinds of limitations would be necessary to protect students on campus. He also kind of directly answered or at least alluded to one of the questions that got Claudine Gay bounced from being the president. One of the questions that got problematic during that House hearing about anti-Semitism and attacking Israel. He said to the Harvard Crimson, quote, can anti-Semitic attacks take the form of attacks against Israel? The answer is yes, that is possible, unquote. So that's part of his effort to kind of distance himself from how Claudine Gay handled that. And she did not handle that well at all. But again, Harvard is one of those that's under investigation for its response to anti-Semitism by the House Committee on Education and the Workforce. So it behooves him to speak out very quickly and in a very full-throated way about all of this. The other factor that is worth noting, two other factors I think that are worth noting, and then I will let this go. We noted that Claudine Gay faced accusations of plagiarism and that there is a larger effort to kind of use plagiarism as a cudgel to beat higher education into a different shape. Well, now there is another plagiarism accusation against Harvard's top diversity officer, another black woman, named Sherry Charleston. This also comes to us from the Harvard Crimson. She is the chief diversity and inclusion officer at Harvard University. And according to the Harvard Crimson, an anonymous complaint filed on Monday alleges 40 different counts of plagiarism in Ms. Charleston's previous work. This was first reported by a conservative publication called the Washington Free Beacon, which was also the publication that helped go after Claudine Gay initially. The issue here is Sherry Charleston's doctoral dissertation at Michigan, which she, which included, according to this complaint, 28 various instances of plagiarism and 12 instances, allegedly, in an article written in the Journal of Negro Education that was co-authored with her husband, LeVar Charleston, and the dean of Michigan State's College of Education, Gerlando Jackson. So the complaints have been filed to those institutions, according to the Washington Free Beacon, and if you look at the way the Harvard Crimson has broken down the complaints, the issue is that there were a number of instances that seem to be lifted rather precisely without attribution. Now, this is the kind of thing that perhaps could be fixed just with quotation marks and with footnotes, but this is the accusation. Now, the fact that the accusation is anonymous does not necessarily negate it. You don't necess It's not like being in court where you get to face your accuser all the time. Higher ed works differently. So it's not that these accusations have no merit, but the effort to kind of go through everybody's record, particularly people who are in this DEI space, is very concerted. And it's one of the things that Bill Ackman himself has said is going to continue to be a tactic in the work of dismantling DEI. This is not going to go away 
at all. Like, this is not going to stop. I don't know that it necessarily has to stop because the controversy around DEI could end up making DEI programs stronger and better. It's entirely possible that they could come out of this vastly improved from what they were. But this is going to keep growing. It's not going to stop. It's not going to go away. And I think that some of these complaints need to be dealt with in a way that, like I said, raises the question about how all of this is actually supposed to make schools better, how this is actually supposed to keep kids safer on campus. I just don't see it. I don't see the benefit of any of this. I do see, other than the benefit to the people who are making these accusations, I see how it could potentially benefit them. But for the kids, I, I don't know how this is actually going to make kids safer. Remember when this was all just about protecting Jewish kids on campus? Seems like forever ago now. It seems like forever ago now.